so do you believe in this um, engagement leverage of um, interest and to motivate people do you think gamification could work or do you think it could only work in some fields um. I, I don't think it's not going to be universal, but we know that from uh, from research into word of mouth, for example, word of mouth advocacy, because I think it's linked to word of mouth advocacy. Whenever somebody you create, when you create a, a sentiment of in uh, of involvement with a customer, so the more customers and feel involved with your brand um, or your store, the more they own it, the more they're likely to advocate it, the more loyal they're going to become. They're going to become. So I think that is a. Uh, a universal trait that works whether in B2B, B2, so low interest categories, high interest categories. If you can, the more you can involve your customers in the business, the more loyalty and advocacy you're going to benefit from. The trick is to make it not look tricksy, not make it look like a marketing ploy, is to actually really do it, to really listen to customers rather than just pretending to listen to customers, rather than run sort of marketing. Tri uh, sort of campaigns where you, you get to choose the next flavor of uh, uh, of some snack, where it actually is more than just a, a promotional gimmick. You're actually trying to hardwire the voice of the customer into what you're doing. Um, I think it, when you're doing when you're doing that, when you're hardwiring the voice of the customer, where I think it. It's not going to work in every case, and it's where it's it might fall flat is when you're just using it as a marketing gimmick. You know, there there have been a lot of companies um, who adopted badges and other gaming um, elements to engage their customers, but it yeah. just didn't work. It just didn't yeah. work. Uh, so my question was about that. Do you think it, there are some fields in which it may work? best or it's about the strategy you adopt? Is it about the product you sell or just how how you propose uh, your gamification strategy to your customers? I think it's, it's, step, it's one step up. I think game mechanics are, you know, humans, we, we, we play. We're, we're playful creatures. We play whenever we can play. We play. We play games with each other. We play games at work. We play. We play games. So, and learning from the mechanics of games and even the great game strategy is something that taps into something fundamental in human psychology. And so I think that's something that brands can learn from um, and always will be a rich source of insight and, and innovation. So take, for example, the Penguin Club, you know, the, which is you know, the, the social network for kids. Um, and uh, they allow people to play for free online, there's games involved, play free online, but then they got an online store. Um, and when they can play, the kids can play free and they win points that they can then redeem in store. But in order to get access to the store, they then need to become paying members. So that kind of smart game strategy, whereas, you know, your kid said, Mom, can I have uh, you know, sort of five euro a month to join the Penguin uh, Penguin Club? And Mom says, No, of course you can't. Everything's free on the internet. You're not having having that. When the kid says, Ah, oh, but Mum, yeah, you know, I've been playing. It's free to play, and I've got all these points. And if I get, and only just get, but I need to be a member to get access to the store to get all these really great stuff. Can I? Can you then just sign me up? Well, then you do, and it's five, and it's a subscription-based model, so you, you don't notice five euro going out every month, and so it's just a really smart way of learning from how games work online that brands can learn from. And I think, yeah, subscription, the freemium model where it's free to get access, but then if you want access to new levels, to new things, I think there's all sorts of learning there. I think the kind of the badging stuff and the uh, and the treasure treasure hunts that brands uh, uh, the brand brands run where you have to check into places. My personal experience with brands working with that is that it's just too much effort for most people. I mean, of course, a brand is at the centre of the world for a brand manager because it pays to do to manage the brand, so it's really important. But if you actually take a consumer perspective, it's one brand amongst many brands in terms of a life, which has got it's more about people and. 
mm-hmm. goals and so you occupy this tiny little space and trying to say, hey, well, we, you can do this really great treasure hunt, uh, here, brand treasure hunt. We got to only got to check into 329 places in order to get some virtual badge you can put up on your on your social networking page that you may not want anyway. I think it's not. You know, I, I don't think it's respect, either understanding or respecting the customer enough. Okay, so um, I have another question for you. Um, in the new publishing industry, uh, and not only, uh, there's a um, growing need of profiles, I mean real people, uh, who combine the technological capacities with uh, a human creative capacity. What do you think about that? Well, well so I'm not quite sure I understand the question. What's, what, for example, what do you well, give me an example of what you're talking about? Um, in you know, in, in publishing, in the new way of publishing, um, for example, online books, online yeah. content. You know, it's not just about the creative, humanistic. Aspect. It's about also about the technological part. You, you need more people who have um, the, that kind of uh, mix. So, what, what do you think about this change? Well, I think it makes access. I mean, people can do things now that used to be. You know, yeah. Mark said it was the ownership of you know power lied in those. You know, the ownership of the means of production. So, if you take it from uh, the production being, he was talking mostly about industrial production, but in terms of media production as well. So, you know, the hands, the the, the ownership of the means of, of production, media production, used to lie in the hands of a very media elite. What's happened now is that pretty much anybody can do it. And you can only see, we're talking about crowdsourcing a few a few minutes ago, and you just see what's happened with the stock photos. Now you've got great technology that allows people who are not brilliant photographers but to take brilliant photography and through technology upload them to sites such as iStock Photo and sell direct. So what, um, well, what technology does is, is shifting the ownership of the means of media production to media consumers or pro consumers we prosume we create text we create blogs we create our news feed we're media creators and technology allows us to uh, to to spread good content or gives the potential to spread good content far and wide so I think you're getting a, you're making media more meritocratic so you're starting to see authors you know through self-publishing through the Kindle there are a few uh, Kindle heirs or whatever they're calling them you know people have sold a million uh, uh, million uh, um, books on the Kindle, self-publishing. If you've got really and you've got a highly networked society and you've got the digital means of media production, then you just allow good content to spread virally and you don't need these middlemen. So I think it's you, you we're getting a cut with turning into a more meritocratic uh, digital you know, digital's making culture more meritocratic. So do you think this actually brings us to the concept of social journalism in in some ways and for, for some aspects? Yeah, I think it, I think it's tough. I mean, I think anybody who wants to get involved in uh, uh, outsourced journalism um, or, or, or this sort of notion of social social journalism would do well to to read. Um, the book Crowdsourcing, where Jeff Howe actually worked with uh, a group of people trying to do exactly that, getting citizen journalists to come together to produce a magazine, to produce a you know, sort of platform. And the whole thing was a complete disaster, because just like we were talking about the chicken things, it was too complicated. People will do things, that, that the trick to crowdsourcing is to allow people people to make money out of stuff they're doing already, trying to get people to do new stuff, getting people to go out and report stuff. I mean, you run this, you know, it's your successful site, but it's, it's an effort, it's work. You can't just to, you know, you can't crowdsource this interview. It's got to be, it's somebody who takes ownership has got to be done, somebody who cares about it enough. So I think there are, there are limits to the organizational capacity of citizen journalism or social social social, social journalism. Um, so I think it's more in the organization, um, but it, as a way of getting great journalists to have a bigger digital footprint and work with uh, with with. And, well, 
and better media outlets. I think it's absolutely fantastic. But I don't think we're going to see the rise of some kind of amateur or uh, amateur journalism. Just you wouldn't want a brain, you know, sort of amateur brain surgeon to give you brain surgery. You didn't want you don't want an amateur journalist to do an analysis of what's going happening in the Middle East. You want somebody who knows what they're talking about. Yeah, even though uh, we were talking about uh, Libya earlier, and actually most of the information initially came from um, Twitter users. Um, mm -hmm. So from that point of view, I, I think it, it can be a real change in the way we do information, especially, especially in, in Italy. Mm -hmm. um, because some journalists will only talk about uh, the way they see things uh, when they're influenced politically. So, yeah. so when when that happens and you don't have uh, real in information from you know journalists who do that for a living, then uh, social media can become a a real uh, source of information, in my opinion. Yeah, and I think it's the quality of of the information, um, whether it's genuine or not. I think you make a good point that the. There are certain political imperatives about what a journalist can or cannot say when he's being paid by a media outlet that has certain political views, has certain political uh, persuasions. So you're going to get whatever's going to happen. You're going to get an edited version. Um, what you what you get with social networks um, and the so-called you know, sort of Twitter revolutions, um, you're getting unedited stuff. But there's also no quality control, and there is so much information out there. Then I have a, a challenge to, um, uh, to 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 actually filter it and get relevant, trustworthy, trust trustworthy information. Uh, so I think at least to a certain extent, it's better the devil you know than the devil you don't. So at least when you know you're reading a slightly right-wing uh, Italian newspaper that you know you're going to get right-wing politics in there and you're going to be able to discount it. When you're getting it from Twitter, you don't know whether it's true or it's not true. You don't know the political allegiances of the people there. You don't know why they're saying it's out of context. It's in Teletubby thinking, so it's got to be in 140 characters, and you know there's a reason why you know philosophers never really talked in 140 character things because you can't string thoughts together, you can't build arguments. It's just you know there is a I'm quite my personal conviction is that you know Twitter is great for people who like making T-shirt slogans. You know if you have a bumper slogan on your car or so T-shirt slogans, that's great, but you're not going to change the world with it. Um, I think it's so. So I'm, I'm actually quite sceptical of the power of, of social media, apart from an initial sense of "Wow, we can do this." To actually go beyond the the burst of energy to into something where you can actually manage and control uh, and organize um, uh, any kind of social, social event or even social, social organism.